Welcome everyone to Fair Districts Redistricting 101. I'm Jen Miller with the League of Women Voters and today I am joined by two of my very dear friends, Catherine Turser and Mia Lewis from Common Cause Ohio. We've been busy over the last decade and, and for years now working to bring uh, redistricting reform to the people all of you or many of you participated in this, either collecting signatures or getting your friends to vote uh, for the initiatives in 2015 to reform how state house maps are made and in 2018 to reform how congressional maps are made. So we're gonna have a great time today. First, Mia is going to talk about what redistricting is and why we have to do it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why it's important to have fair districts. Catherine will go through the new rules and timelines for drawing new maps. And then you'll once again hear from Ms. Mia about how to, uh, how, what you can do to make sure that Ohio has fair maps. Awesome, thank you so much, Jen. So we're gonna start from the beginning with the kind of most basic um, explanation of redistricting. And actually before we get to redistricting, we'll talk very briefly about apportionment. So what apportionment is, is no matter what the population is in the United States, we always have 435 congressional districts, 435 members of the US House of Representatives. And because the population changes, we have to re, um, re jig that every 10 years, we reapportion them to distribute them proportionally um, among the different states according to population. Every state has at least one, but then because some states population has grown and others it has um, gone down, um, we, we apportion the rest of those 435 um, congressmen according to population. And the big deal is when you lose or gain uh, a congressman. So Ohio is very, very likely it's not going to be official until the end of April, but it's very likely to move from 16 to 15 congressional districts. And of course, that will take some, um, you know, uh, rejigging in terms of uh, who's going to be running and all those kinds of things. So that's apportionment. Um, but in addition to apportionment, we have redistricting. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in Ohio, we we going from 16 to 15 con US congressional districts, the House, Ohio House and Senate districts, those numbers don't change. We're gonna have 33 senators as always and 99 representatives as always as per the Ohio constitution. And those 99 um, representatives, three are nested inside each uh, Senate district. Um, but for both the congressional districts and the Ohio House and Senate districts, we need to do redistricting. So what exactly is redistricting? Well, what it is is basically it's redrawing lines to make sure that each district has the same number of people. So let's say we have um, a fictional district here with 20 people and we have four, we, we have an area with 20 people and four districts. So we're gonna wanna divide it um, so that we end up with five in each district. Well, that's great, but over time, populations shift. Some people are born, some die, some move. There may be economic downturn in an area and people need to move to get jobs somewhere else. And so you end up with populations becoming unequal. And so every 10 years, there's redistricting where we redraw those lines in order to make uh, the districts equal again. In this fictional uh, representation here, the population has grown. And so now you have six people um, in every district instead of five, but it could be that the population has shrunk or it stayed the same and they've just shifted from one part of the state or one part of the area to another. And so we've had to redraw those districts in order to make sure that they're fair. And this is done every 10 years after the US census. So that's part of the constitution um, that we have a census that we count everybody. Um, and then we can do that redistricting because we know where people live and we can make sure that the rep there's representational fairness where um, there's equal uh, population in all the different districts. And the census can lead to a lot of political battles as it has um, you know, in the past couple of years. And it's also been complicated this time around by COVID because there were, there were delays, there, 
going to be delays in um, the delivery of the census data, and that will have an impact um, on redistricting. So let's talk just for a minute about what happens when you redraw those district lines every 10 years. And again, this is not only for US Congress, but for the state legislature, for the state uh, representatives and senators, and also for local districts as well. There's redistricting every 10 years. And the fact is that drawing those lines, having the power to draw those lines uh, is really significant. It gives you a lot of power. It's an opportunity to um, grab power and get more representation for your group in the years ahead if you're the one who can draw those lines. And this is one of my favorite examples here. Let's say you have 50 people and um, 20 of them are of one persuasion, um, political persuasion, and 30 of them are of a different political persuasion. Now, you could draw lines so that there's perfect representation. You see these long skinny lines here in, in uh, number one um, example. And if you drew them perfectly like that, you could have two representatives for the yellows and three representatives for the greens. And that's proportional to people's political views and it, it's fair. Um, now let's say you gave green the power to draw the lines. They can draw these districts in a way that it's compact but it's really not fair at all because what they've done is there's two things we talk about when um, in gerrymandering, unfair uh, redistricting is packing and cracking. And in this example here, they have cracked um, the yellows and put a little bit of yellow in each district. So they've just put it a little bit in each so that they will basically lose the contest every time and they'll end up with five green representatives and zero yellow representatives. That's not fair at all. But let's look at this final example here. And this is when yellows have the power to draw the lines. And what yellows have done is they have actually packed. They've taken two districts and essentially forfeited them to their opposition to the greens. They've packed extra greens into those districts. And then they've cracked the remaining greens into the other districts. And even though they're clearly a minority, the yellows have come out with three representatives and the greens only have two. And so that's just to demonstrate the power you have when you're drawing the lines without any rules, without any guidelines that require you to either have bipartisan map making or limits on this kind of um, distortions. So we call these distortions in redistricting gerrymandering. And it's as old as the Republic. Um, it, the origin of the term comes from this dude over here called Elbridge Gerry. Um, he was around from the very beginning. He signed the Declaration of Independence. And he was the one who figured out that if you drew a district in this kind of distorted way and you grabbed your people and you pushed the opposition into these other areas that you could come out on top. And because it looked very strange like this, a political cartoon of the day um, called it a gerrymander, like a salam salamander. And we're still dealing, excuse me, we're still dealing with this today. And of course, with computers and, um, you know, very, uh, very, very highly, um, you know, highly technical mapping software, um, the gerrymanders just get better and better all the time. Um, and so this was the result of the last uh, redistricting, which was in 2011. You can see that the districts are very uh, distorted and strange. They're very highly gerrymandered. Um, and we're, you know, we're dealing with the consequences of that um, all the time. Um, what we have as a result of the gerrymander is a lack of representational fairness. And what that means is if you look overall at how people vote, um, you the way they vote, let's say in a presidential election um, for a presidential candidate does not equal what happens um, in Congress. So uh, from 2012 to 2020 in Ohio, you've had a 45-55 split in terms of voting for president, but you have a 25-75 split when it comes to um, 
members of the US Congress. And so that's the result of gerrymandering and the same in the state house. And um, there are all kinds of other bad things that come from gerrymandering, no, com no lack of competitiveness um, in congressional districts, um, extremism, the real competition is in the primary at, because it's a foregone conclusion who's gonna win in November. And so um, the real competition becomes more and more extreme um, in the primary. So these are some of the bad things that can happen because of gerrymandering. And Jen's gonna talk more specifically about some districts in Ohio and the things that have happened um, in Ohio because of these bad maps. And then we'll go on to talk about our situation now and how it's gotten a lot better. So I'm gonna turn over to Jen. So one of the things we need to do is tell the story about gerrymandering so that the everyday public remembers that they voted for these reforms and that they understand that um, the way it is right now is not representative or fair for anyone. We're going to take one district and again we could tell these stories about state house maps or various congressional districts. We're going to look at district nine which is called snake on the lake with Marcy Kaptur. Um, this is the first time that District 9 has included pieces of Cleveland and Toledo. Um, it's, a nine, it's 96 miles from one edge to the other. And actually, if you were to try to drive that, the northern edge of that, you'd actually have to go, or the southern edge too, you'd have, have to go through the water um, or leave the district. So this is an unusual district that was really designed to pit Marcy Kaptur against another Democratic incumbent. Um, and one of the things we wanted to talk about is how any of these districts, I mean, I'm sorry, any of these cities could be encapsulated in one congressional district. There's no need, and of course we need equal population or, or close to equal population, but there's no need in any scenario to ever have Cleveland and Toledo in the same category, but also we've split lots of little communities that are now into multiple districts. So down below is this is Florence Township of 2,400 people. Um, that's their homepage um, from November 4th, 2015. Dr. Niven found this um, from University of Cincinnati. And what he's talking about here is they just got so excited for finally getting a blue male Dropbox. They had never had a blue mailbox before. They're so tiny that they don't even have a post office, but somehow the map makers thought that they were so big that they needed to be in more than one congressional district. Clearly that's not fair and that's not representative. Let's go to the next slide. And so there's something else as we think about uh, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, you know, and asked about the map, and really, you know, she's done a lot of work in Cleveland or has traveled to Cleveland, but she's never represented Cleveland in all of her long history in public service. And she said, if I go into a place where I don't have that rootedness, it makes it much more difficult to make good decisions for the people. So now all of a sudden, you know, she's an expert on the needs of Northwest Ohio. And all of a sudden she has to also think about Cleveland. But here's the other thing that I think is really interesting is trying to represent your constituents when there is such absolute diversity and political beliefs, as you see here in terms of the counties, how they supported Republicans or Democrats, but even more so if we think about economics. So occupations by county. So in Cuyahoga, it's mostly science. There's almost no farming. Um, whereas in Ottawa, it's almost entirely farming. Um, and, and so just thinking about balancing all of those needs of constituents and trying to really represent the needs of constituents becomes hard when um, a district is so weirdly shaped for the point of making uh, gerrymandering work. And then there's also some other things with poor access. And this is, I think, a really important point because first off, I wanna say this, gerrymandering hurts every voter. Even if you're a Republican and you live and you are represented by a Republican and you are in an overwhelmingly um, Republican state when it comes to the entire congressional district or either state house, um, it, but here's the thing at the end of the day, our representatives don't have to listen to us if they know they're gonna win their seat. Um, and so it does mean that access for all of us is, is, is less and our ability to really have representative government is, is weakened through partisan gerrymandering. But here's a really interesting one, again, from Dr. Niven um, out of Cincinnati, 3.6 million Ohioans live closer to a congressional district 
um, that is not their congressperson. They're, they're a con so 3.6 million Ohioans, uh, their closest congressional district office is not their congressperson. So I'm going to give an example. Um, I used to live in Old North, so part of University District, and I was in Congressman Bal Balderson's district. His office for me was nine miles away, where Congresswoman Joyce Beatty's was only four miles away. I have a good friend who lives in Mansfield, very different economically um, and culturally than North Campus or Zanesville, which is all of Congressional District 12. And that friend from Mansfield to travel to Congressperson Balderson's office is about 60 miles, but to the net to some to a congressperson who is not theirs is only 30 miles. So this idea of it becomes hard to really have access or to be representative when it's hard even just to get to your congressperson. Absolutely. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. Um, and I gonna, oh, I'm sorry, I was just going to mention one more thing. It's also okay. confusing for for uh, for congressional people as well. So I have a friend who was in tw who thought he was in 12 um, because the Board of Elections accidentally put him in Congressional District 12 because the lines get really confusing in Franklin County. He used to meet regularly with with Tiberi, who also thought he was in 12 to find out recently that he was put in the wrong district and that he was supposed to be Joyce Beatty constituent. So how can we possibly um, uh, push our lawmakers to represent us when neither, sometimes neither the lawmaker nor the voter know what district they're in because the lines are so confusing? Absolutely. Catherine. So where are we today is this section. Um, so, so one of the things that I'm always impressed by are how long the redistricting reformers had to wait. Now we passed state legislative redistricting reform in 2015. Still don't have new state legislative district maps. We passed congressional redistricting reform in 2018 and we have had to wait until this year to actually get to the map making meaning we won't actually have elections under the new fairer system until 2022. And I think for a lot of us, um, that notion of, of waiting and planning uh, for the census uh, and to have it finally get here, it's very exciting to finally be in a place where we're going to be focusing on the new maps. Now, it is a little bit complicated. And me, if you're willing to move to the, to the next section, you know, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at, look at some of the rules. And one of the things that's important is you're thinking about these rules, they are a little bit complicated, but no one should feel like the complication means that we can't be engaged or we can't be focused on calling for fairer maps because it really is all about making sure that we get good representation. So me, if you'll move to the next slide. So I, I wanted to highlight this. So, so for a lot of us, um, there's this whole thing of like, well, how is it even constitutional that they do this crazy map making? Clearly it hurts voters. It makes it harder for our elected officials to represent us. It has all of these different consequences for you know, pu public policy. You know, one of the things we say is you know, fair districts equal fair elections. Um, which leads to good policy. Well, wait a second, how is it even constitutional? And what is really sad is in, in 2019 and Rusha v. Common Cause, um, the Supreme Court Chief Justice Roberts said, well, gerrymandering is not under the province of the federal, uh, federal judiciary. Meaning, yes, we identify it as a problem. Yes, it clearly is not right for democracy but it's not up to us to fix it. And so it was not declared to be unconstitutional. And that means as you look at these rules, they can be a little bit complicated and you can see that they are a compromise, but it's important to realize that there are many, many states who have not had the opportunity to even put good rules about keeping a community together in place. And so Mia, if you'll move us to the next slide. So I'm gonna go through some basic ones that fit for both Ohio House, Ohio Senate and Congress. And so some of these rules y'all will be real familiar with. Um, congressional and state legislative districts have to be compact, meaning 
hey, you can imagine they have to be closer together. So you're not going to have that Marcy Capture District that goes from Toledo to Cleveland. Um, they need to be contiguous. Um, and so in other words, you can't, you know, they need to be connected. Now, there are other rules that affect both state house, state senate, and congress, and that is the focus on keeping political subdivisions together. And this is a good proxy for thinking about keeping communities together. There's, there's a focus on counties, cities, and townships, and keeping them whole as much as possible. The other thing that's important to realize as we're going through these rules is that public hearings are required for both map making processes. And this is where we can all step in and promote what we want when it comes to map making. And so Mia, if you'll move us to the next slide. So here's some basic rules. Um, the best way to think about them for Congress is that they address the worst excesses of gerrymandering. Okay, so what are the worst? One political party draws the district lines and they run, you know, they basically run over the other political party and marginalize them and make it much more difficult um, for the other political party to and get their, get their folks elected. It makes um, the elections less competitive. Um, and so what we really focused on in the congressional redistricting reform is that there's bipartisan map making. Um, and because let's face it, bipartisan map making is a bunch of arm wrestling, there is in fact a process for the two political parties to figure out how it is that they're gonna come up with a map together. What's another terrible thing about gerrymandering? Um, you know, we know that maps were created um, behind the scenes. In 2011, in fact, the district lines were actually drawn in a place that the map makers called the bunker. And it was a hotel room about 500 feet away from the Ohio State House. And so what we really want is transparency. So you got bipartisan map making, you have transparency in the process, and then to give us all the tools you know, we live in a really wonderful time period where we can crowdsource, you know, we can crowdsource the, the map making and so that we can all participate more fully because let's face it, it's pretty hard to testify if you're just saying, I want my community together. But if you can show what you mean, that's completely different. And then Mia, if you'll move us along. So I wanted to highlight that there are rules on keeping the counties whole. Now this is important because if you if you think about if you think about congressional districts, they're they're going to be you know likely 15 of them. Right now we have 16. They're fairly large districts around Ohio, and it's important to think about well what about keeping communities together? Well, the building blocks of our state are those counties, and so we focused on you know the focus is on keeping 65 of those entirely in, within one district, right? And so that notion of, okay, so we have this picture here of Cuyahoga County and in Cuyahoga County, it's in four congressional districts. Well, you couldn't do that. And so as we're thinking about, you know, the rules now, I also want to highlight this point. Um, these are the maximum, meaning they can split 65 counties. You know, they can't split 65 counties. They can split 18 counties, but that doesn't mean that they have to. It just gives them a little bit of room just in case because the Ohio Constitution is supposed to last for a very long time. Um, and so we're talking about map making in 2031, 2041, et cetera. And me, if you'll move us along. So one of the things I think that is important is what you can't do. Um, so in this, you'll see a picture of Mercer County. Mercer County is located on the Indiana border um, and it is, you know, a rural county that is split into three congressional districts. Can happen. This is not something that will happen as we move forward. And then, you know, I mentioned Cuyahoga County before being in four congressional districts. Well, so is Summit County. And when we start to think about what this actually means for representation, it's just so blatantly unfair. So going forward in 2021, the map makers are going to have to focus on not dividing counties, but also this is important, that if a county has enough population to support a congressional district, 
A good example, you know, Franklin County, um, they have enough population to actually have a district wholly in that county. Well, so does Cuyahoga, so does Hamilton. If they have enough population, they are required by the Ohio Constitution to keep that district whole. And, you know, I think that's, that's exciting because then, you know, where do we get gerrymandering? It's when you can wiggle and squiggle and move things actually around. And so I, I think it's important to realize that population does dictate some splitting. So the size of Columbus is large enough that there will have to be a split there, but that's a split based on population. And we all have an opportunity to testify and to make sure that when they do that split, they're not doing the kind of Rorschach ink plot that they did with Joyce Beatty's district that looks like this. And with that, Mia, if you'll move us along, so I mentioned that the congressional redistricting um, is bipartisan. This can be a real challenge. And so when the state legislature was in process of thinking through, well, how do you actually make sure that you can get to an actual map? They created a process where they said, okay, well, what do we really want? We wanna have 60% of the members with 50% of both political parties. So in this case, they say the largest political parties in case all of a sudden we, the Whig party becomes big, but it really means in this case, the Democrats and the Republicans. Now, this is really hard. Like if you think about this is they're, they're trying to come up with really a super majority of folks supporting this. And it could be a real challenge. We're in real partisan times. So then they say, okay, if we can't actually do this, we're going to give this to the Ohio Redistricting Commission. And the Ohio Redistricting Commission still needs to have four of their seven members and then two members of each of the largest political parties. And so you're talking about Dems and Republicans. Now, I think one of the things that is important is we know there's gonna be arm wrestling, but at any point in this, it's, it's not like they have to go through all these stages. What they have to do is come up with a map for Ohioans and to do their best to come up with uh, fair maps. And so one of the things that we know is that Ohioans, more than 70% for both state legislature and for Congress voted for fair maps, that that was the expectation that they have. And the other thing to remember is that the redistricting reform won in all 88 counties. There was not a single county that said, oh no, fear maps are not for me. Now, if the Ohio Redistricting Commission can actually get the job done, it goes back to the state legislature. And you'll notice that it then requires a third of both of the political parties or both Dems and Republicans. And then if they absolutely cannot get the job done, they have a four, they can do a four year map with additional requirements, including some very clear rules about creating written, written explanations for their maps and a really clear prohibitions on, on gerrymandering or creating a map to favor or disfavor a political party or candidate. Now, it says then yeah, at some point along the way, congressional maps are approved. I think the thing to remember is we're talking about this being a bill, right? A bill that becomes law can actually be um, vetoed by the governor. It can also be referendum, meaning that citizens can collect signatures if in fact the maps do not live up to the goals that we all have. So it's important to remember that that is an option that citizens could collect signatures and then take the map to a vote of the people. Mia, if you're willing to move us along. So um, one of the things that we that, that Mia did mention is that there's nesting when it comes to the Ohio House and Senate map. So there are three House districts that go into the Ohio Senate district, right? Um, and that so they call that nesting. And they and and I think it's important when we look at those maps, we think about well, how does this all connect? And it's important when we think about representation, there that oh, I have a house person and I have a Senate person and that it's all connected in the map and we wanna have competitive districts for all of these. And we wanna have our, our um, community represented in all of these. Now for, for the state legislative maps, there's a very, very strong anti-gerrymandering rule that no plan, and in other words, no map, shall be drawn to favor or disfavor a political party and the other thing that I think is important is the, that there's a focus on what they call representational fairness. And that means that if the entire state, 
you know, you take a vote for the entire state and we'll say for president or US Senate and you take that over a 10 year period. And then you say, okay, well, wait a second, Ohio votes 55% Republican and 45% Democrat. Well, the, that means that some of these districts, 55% of them should lean to Republicans and 45% of them should lean to Democrats. Now that's never gonna be absolutely perfect, but it's a way to make sure that there isn't gerrymandering. It just really strengthens that anti-gerrymandering rule. And with that, Mia, I did wanna highlight, okay, so who's gonna draw these district lines uh, for, the, uh, for the Ohio House and Ohio Senate districts? So this is done by the Ohio Redistricting Commission. And you'll remember in the timeline uh, with the arm wrestling over Congress, the Ohio Redistricting Commission is a step when it comes for Congress, um, but they are the official map makers for the Ohio House and Senate districts. And so you're, you know, you're talking about the governor, auditor, secretary of state, and then appointees, Democrat and Republican from both chambers, so Ohio House and Ohio Senate. Now, the thing that I wanna highlight to you all is that there always needs to be, you know, two members of the minor party, in this case, the Democrats, to approve a 10-year map. And so even though you look at this and be like, wait a second, um, there are more Republicans than there are Democrats. The way that they address this is by saying there has to be at least two of both political parties, Democrat, Republican, so that in fact, you can get to a map. And with that, Mia, if you'll move us, I did want to highlight there's a, there is a timeline for all of this. So we're looking at doing map making in the fall. And I think, you know, this is the kind of thing you don't need to know all of these deadlines. What's important to know is in the fall, we're going to be going through the process of map making. And this is the time that we're all going to get engaged in pushing for fairer maps. And on that, I'm going to hand it to Mia. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so, um, We've heard about the bad things about gerrymandering. We've heard that we have new rules. We've heard about this long complicated process. And the question is um, now what do we do? How can we be involved? And how can we try to make sure that we get a better outcome? Um, and honestly, um, you guys are gonna make a better outcome because by uh, paying attention and by demanding um, by demanding fair maps, and just as Catherine said, by demanding that the people who are drawing the maps live up to our, the expectations of the reform, um, we're going to really be helping the process. We're not going to accept any old maps that they give us. We're going to say, no, that's that map is rubbish. We, you know, we can do much better than that. So the first thing is, um, I want to say there's this link at the top there um, that's a form that you can fill out to say that how you would like to be involved. And of course, um, if you go to the slides after watching this, you'll be able to click on that link and get to that form and fill it out. But I'm going to go briefly through the things that are listed on the form. And one is just, um, you know, being educated yourself and staying informed, spreading the word, attending events, talking to other people about how they can get involved, um, really important. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to know all of these details. You just need to know we need fair maps. We demand fair maps. This We expect this and we are educated about it. We're going to reject the maps that are not good. Um, we have a speakers bureau that we're training people to be a part of a lot of groups all around the state of groups of every different kind um, want to know about redistricting and you don't need to be an expert to just share a slide presentation with them um, and to let them know how they can get involved so we're looking for folks who um, are interested in doing that and you can sign up to be a part of the speakers bureau um, we have a training coming up but of course it will be recorded and even if you don't catch it in uh, live, you can participate as well. We're going to need folks to be watchdogs and to hold their legislators accountable and also the Ohio Redistricting um, Commission. So that'll mean emails, calls, letters to the editor, um, you know, even uh, meeting with them. So um, that's something that we will give you lots of information about. We're going to need to pressure them to um, not only about the maps, but pressure them about having enough public hearings, pressure them about um, making sure they have the right implementing legislation. Uh, set to go. There's all kinds of things that we need them to step up and do, and we can start working on that now. Additional ways that you can get involved. 
community map making, um, Catherine talked about that a little bit. So um, some of these bigger cities or counties will need to be split. And so we need information about um, where is it gonna be best to draw those lines? And the best place to draw the lines is so that you don't divide communities. And how can you define a community? Well, you can define a community by actually trying to make a map and showing this map represents my community. And what we can do, um, we can make these maps and then there'll be a way to tag them so that later on when people are drawing um, not just their own community but drawing districts for the whole state they'll be able to go and get the information from all the different community maps that have been drawn by groups all across the state so we're looking folks to participate in community map making and we're looking for folks to to be facilitators um, for their own community and bring people together and uh, figure out together as a group, what is our community? How do we define it? What do we, where do we care that, you know, that stays together? A separate thing will be um, a map making competition. And that will start a little bit later. It's delayed because the census is delayed. We can't really start it until we have all the information that we need. Um, and that will probably use a different program. Um, and folks will be taking some of the information from the community map making and they'll be trying to draw the best maps that they possibly can. This is incredibly important because if we have 100 people who draw excellent maps, keeping communities together, not splitting counties with representational fairness and all of those other things, then uh, the, the official process comes out with a map that's you know, really not that great, we can say, wow, that map really isn't very good. We have a hundred maps here that are much better on all these criteria that are part of our constitution, compactness, um, fairness, representation, all of that, all of that. And that will be very, very important to be able to show that we have better maps. Um, lastly, I'll talk about transparency team. It's going to be really important for us to um, have all the information about how they drew their maps and to make sure that we get all the all the details on the process. And so we're going to be training um, in March, there's Sunshine Week um, in Ohio, and we're going to be training folks on how to do things like um, file a, a request for information using the Freedom of Information Act. We want the records of how you had, you know, what your discussion was when you were drawing that map. We want there to be um, transparency and disclosure so that we know who's supporting what and how these bills were written. So that's another way to get involved. Um, and here's a quick timeline about being involved. So we're gonna be doing the map making tutorials and community map making um, starting now, public pressure campaigns starting now, speakers bureau training starting now. And then once we get that um, census data, then we'll be doing the map making competition that'll be late summer um, or early fall. And then in the fall, um, when we have the public hearings of the Ohio Redistricting Commission and the state legislature, we're gonna need folks to um, participate in those hearings. So that is that. We've also put a few resources here for you um, and we are always available. Um, we will, on the slides, we will add our emails so that you can contact us um, if you have questions. Um, we really, we need fair maps um, because that will make our state, um, we'll, it'll restore functionality to our government in a way that we're really lacking right now. Um, any last words, Jen and Catherine? Well, thank you so much. And I'm so looking forward to just getting into the map making. And I hope you are too. So excited. Democracy is a participatory sport. We have time. We have, this is the time to really be digging in. We have the chance to really transform Ohio and how it serves its people. Thank you.